as certain as the dawn follows the night, it is that idea that nothing is sacred. So every movie will eventually be remade. This list will probably be remade at some point. That's just how the world works. With that in mind, I'm Sean Ferrick for What Culture Horror, and here are 10 failed horror movie remakes that could have been amazing. Number 10, Jacob's Ladder. The original Jacob's Ladder from 1990 saw Tim, I just crawled through a sewer pipe, Robbins, play an American soldier in Vietnam who, after his platoon comes under an attack, finds himself in an alternate version of New York. This leads to some bizarre and highly unsettling moments, all of which are tied together masterfully by director Adrian Lin to create a film that is high concept without ever being too confusing. Though not a commercial smash, Jacob's Ladder has maintained a strong following. Its influence can be felt all over pop culture, so when a remake was released in 2019, hopes were high that this hidden gem might finally get the mainstream recognition that it deserved. Uh, yeah, a spoiler, it, it didn't. The new Jacob's Ladder, which was directed by David M. Rosenthal and cast Michael Ely in the Robins role, was a jumbled, uncoordinated mess, lacking any of the tact that made the first film so compelling. Less of a ladder, more of a but naughty step. Number nine, House of Wax, 2005. 2005's House of Wax is a very loose remake of a film that was itself a new version of something old. House of Wax from 1953 starred Vincent Price as a deranged artist who displayed his wax-covered victims' bodies as sculptures. Two decades earlier, a film called Mystery of the Wax Museum had a similar presence, which means this subject can trace its history back to before World War II. Quite the legacy then. Be a shame if someone were to mess it up. The 2005 version of House of Wax is a much more brutal in its portrayal of the candle-based killings, which should have made it more appealing to modern audiences. Instead, said audiences were unimpressed by how heavily it relied on worn-out slasher tropes and how it turned a unique concept into just another teen horror flick. Number eight, The Fog, 2005. Being underappreciated is kind of John Carpenter's thing, pun intended which makes a lot of his great movies from the 70s and 80s prime targets for redos several years later. There was the 2011 version of The Thing, which flopped, sadly. It was a good concept, but some of the execution and all that CGI just didn't do it justice. Then there was Rob Zombie's Halloween, which was unfortunately a critical disaster, despite taking a new direction on the story. Oh, and don't forget about the new and entirely unremarkable Assault on Precinct 13. Be honest, you forgot. Not a great track record then of remakes, and unfortunately the 2005 version of Carpenter's 1980 film The Fog does not book this trend. In the original, a mysterious smog descends on a seaside town, bringing with it the spirits of dead soldiers who are out for revenge against those who wronged them. The 2005 attempt, directed by Rufus Wainwright, follows the same premise only much less competently. Wainwright's fog is so pedestrian, not scary in the slightest, and not bold enough to encapsulate the themes of collective guilt the story revolves around. The original is, admittedly, not Carpenter's best work, but the new one failed to rectify any of the earlier one's mistakes, doubling down on them instead. Number seven, Flatliners, 2017. Coming after St. Elmo's Fire on The Lost Boys, but before Batman and Robin, in Joel Schumacher's filmography. Flatliners is a horror with a sci-fi twist as a group of teenagers attempt to find out what lies beyond death. Starring big hitters like Kiefer Sutherland, Julia Roberts and Kevin Bacon, Flatliners wasn't a runaway success at the box office, nor a critical darling, but it was a genuinely creepy movie with a great premise and some people really liked it. And then the 2017 version came along to attempt to tarnish its name forever. With Danish director Niels Arden Oplev in charge of a similarly star-studded cast featuring Elliot Page, Diego Luna and Nina Dobrev among others, this new Flatliners had all the potential to be great. Instead of completing the original idea, this movie just spun its wheels, recreating the same flawed narrative with about half of the terror and suspense of Schumacher's attempt. It was roundly dumped on by almost everyone who saw it, meaning that, in a fantastic twist of irony, it managed to kill a film series about surviving near-death experiences, which is an achievement if you think about it. Number six, Suspiria, 2018. 
Few directors' names command as much respect and terror than that of Dario Argento, the Italian maestro who helped pioneer the influential giallo subgenre in the 1970s. A favourite amongst Argento's many admirers is 1977's Suspiria, in which an American ballet student discovers a horrifying and otherworldly secret whilst attending a dance school in Germany. And it's not that the cleaners have been going through people's sock drawers, it's way worse than that. 41 years on from Suspiria's debut, fellow Italian Luca Guadagnino took on the hefty task of updating Suspiria for a modern crowd. Guadagnino was coming off the back of Call Me By Your Name, so was on a great run of form. Sadly, that run ended here. This version of Suspiria split critics right down the middle, with most unsure about what to make of the ungodly amount of blood and gore it produced. In that way, it was wholly accurate to Argento's original version. Number five, The Wolfman, 2010. Though most of them were all kinds of kitchen cheesy, the old universal horror flicks from the 1930s and 40s helped establish horror as the cinematic tour de force it is today. One of the most cherished films from this stable is 1941's The Wolfman, which marks the first appearance of Lon Chaney Jr. in the titular furry role. For the 2010 version of The Wolfman, which had become one word for some reason, Benicio Del Toro stepped into Cheney's paws, joined by a stellar cast that included Emily Blunt, Hugo Weaving, and Anthony Hopkins. Whilst the special effects have come a long way since 1941, the rest of the picture left a lot to be desired. It offered little in the way of genuine frights and probably inspired very few people to seek out the source material. A shame, as that old stuff is really fun. Number four, The Omen, 2006. By the time 2006 had come along, the once promising Omen series of films had, fair to say, lost its way. The first one was a revelation, and although every subsequent drop in on Damien the Antichrist got a little more and more dire, a remake of the original 1976 classic would surely help to recenter the franchise and return it to its roots. Did this happen? No. Original screenwriter David Seltzer returned, and the cast was full of celebrities. But unfortunately, Omen 2006 did very little to excite its audience. In fact, it could be argued that it did very little at all, as the finished product was so similar to the first film that people wondered why so much time and money had been spent on making it. We have the Omen at home. Sure, it did killer numbers at the box office, but in terms of kickstarting renewed interest in the story, it flopped. Number three, Black Christmas 2006 and 2019. Poor old Black Christmas has had its reputation soiled not by one, but two subpar do-overs since the first came out in 1974. Across all three iterations, the premise remains the same. A group of teens find themselves trapped in a house on a stormy winter's night, then get picked off one by one by a mystery assailant. The original is now seen as one of the most important horror movies ever made, helping to influence the modern slasher genre. Remaking something so groundbreaking was always going to be a tough ask, and as it turned out, neither of these two films were up to it. The 2006 reboot was way more gory than story, overemphasizing visceral kills instead of giving anyone a reason to care about the walking cadavers. 2019's attempt fared slightly better and came armed with a welcome feminist angle, but was still deemed a poor imitation of a much scarier movie that had just turned 45 years old. Black Christmas is so iconic that anything attempting to recreate it ran a serious risk of coming across as parody. Unfortunately, it took a pair of mediocre movies for people to finally figure that one out. Number two, The Grudge, 2004. The success of the English language remake of The Ring in 2002 left studios up and down America rubbing their hands together with glee at the prospect of importing more Japanese horrors. The big follow-up to The Ring was The Grudge, which came out in 2004, an American retelling of Juan, The Grudge, from two years prior. The central story of the film revolves around a vengeful ghost born after the brutal murder of a woman some years ago. It's up to Sarah Michelle Gellar to sort things out, who, to be fair, is more than qualified to deal with this sort of thing. Whilst there was much praise for the eerie presentation of The Grudge, a lot of viewers found they had absolutely zero idea what was going on. Non-linear films can be exceptional when done right, but this was far too messy and overcomplicated to capture the magic of a memento or a pulp fiction. It may have spawned its own franchise of other less than amazing films and topped the box office, but The Grudge was not the next great Japanese horror remake that it could have been. Number one, A Nightmare on Elm Street. Remember what was said earlier about The Omen? 
about a remake being a good chance to get things back on track? Well, apply that same logic to a series that had also lost its way, but had done so over twice as many films as little old Damien Thorne. It doesn't need saying that the original A Nightmare on Elm Street is one of the greatest and most important horror films ever produced. Wes Craven's One Man War on Sleeping had franchise potential written all over it, but that potential was left frustratingly unfulfilled as the sequels eked out. After eight films of varying quality, 2010 saw the release of a new telling of A Nightmare on Elm Street. Right from the start, though, there were two signs that things weren't going to end well. Craven had nothing to do with it, and Michael Bay was one of the producers. This nightmare was bland, ineffective and hollow, little more than a run-of-the-mill slasher with Freddy Krueger's face superimposed over the top. To be fair, Freddy did look amazing and was played with Apom by Jackie Earl Haley. Still, it didn't excite old fans, failed to bring in any new ones, and at the time of this recording is the last time Elm Street has featured in a cinematic release.